Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I'm Alex Wood, or uh, Bike on the Internet, and I've been working on type inference and cleaver for the last couple months now. Uh, this presentation is going to be kind of distinct from the paper. The paper I wrote back in January and described the work I'd done up till then, and then in the last few months, I pretty much completely rewritten the system. So this talk is going to be about that, but it's the same basic idea because it's not a new change. <coughs> All the code is new, that kind of thing. So first off is what is Cleaver? Uh, Cleaver is um, part of the Sickle project, which is a new colonist implementation um, being developed by Dr. Strand, Stranger. and uh, the point of Sickle is that it's supposed to be very modular. All the components of it can be uh, interconnected in a sensible way. You don't have um, connections forcing them to be used together. So you could, for example, take out the code for the uh, format function and use it in something else. And Cleaver is the, um, the compiler component of the system. So uh, you can use this in other common list systems and implements the compile function and that sort of thing. And um, Cleaver at present is not a full compiler exactly in that it does not output to machine code or anything like that. It stops at the step called uh, MIR, which is an intermediate representation. Uh, but it starts at Lisp source, so it's essentially a compiler front end or a compiler front end framework, I guess, at this point. Um, and then the other system involved is CLASP, which is the project of Dr. Schaffmeister, who is not present. And that is another new Lisp implementation, which is based on integration with the uh, C language uh, for the sake of integrating with existing, existing libraries, that kind of thing. And CLASP uses Cleaver in that it has, uh, in the final build class, um, common Lisp source is fed to Cleaver, and Cleaver outputs the MIR, and then class uh, converts or compiles the MIR into LLVM IR, and LLVM, you probably know, is a compiler backend system originally developed for C. Uh, and then LLVM can take this intermediate representation, and then it can output actual machine code. So it's a pretty convoluted system, but it means that you have a, a back end for Cleaver. And for my purposes, what it means is that since I'm working in, I'm working on Cleaver mainly, I'll implement some optimization or something in Cleaver, and then you know I'll spend a couple weeks on that, and then I'll spend a couple more weeks integrating it into class. And then I spend a couple hours waiting for class to build, and then I boot it up and it's like calls immediately. So the real world is pretty cool, but it's a nice check on what I'm doing. And then the other part of the title is type inference. And this can mean a couple of different things. Um, you have uh, different ideas essentially of what type inference is because you have systems like Inley Milner. I can put your um, that infer types for something like ML or Haskell, and they have systems based on that. And something like that, the type inference can be mainly syntactical. You worry about variables having types, and you can do things like proof correctness of programs or uh, use it for proofs, like Dr. Kostanski was talking about. Uh, but in Cleaver, since it's part of a compiler, it's part of the optimizing compiler. Um, we're essentially worried about values having types, and the entire type system at compile time is more or less optional. The compiler is allowed to just ignore type to equations, that kind of thing. So it's a pretty different kind of universe, and it's mainly oriented towards optimizations, that kind of thing at present. You can also use it to prove correctness, that kind of thing, but that's one of the essential things it's for. Um, so for this reason, instead of working on a syntactical level for type inference, we work on this control flow, control flow graphs. And this is a picture of one of the uh, control flow graphs in the intermediate representation called HIR. And it's called that because it has no, um, there's nothing like stacks or 
addresses or anything like that. It's just Lisp objects uh, being passed around. It's essentially uh, just like any assembly language, though. You have instructions, which are these white boxes. The white boxes are instructions. The black arrows represent control flow. This blue dashed line is an output, and the red dashed lines are inputs. This is a constant input. So you can see all this does is it uh, takes the car of something not pictured and it goes to a branch based on equality where it tests whether the variable x and the constant nil are peak, peak. And if they are, it goes down to one branch and does an assignment. And if they're not, it goes down this two branch and does a different assignment. Um, and the reason that we're, con we're uh, concerned with control flow is that uh, we can assign variables, uh, essentially we can change what type of variable it has. So we can't really talk about the type of x just in general. We can talk about the type of x at a particular point in the program. Uh, more literally, say you have this assignment to y here, and that could alter the type of uh, could all the type of y, of course. If y has already been defined, you might have a new type for y. So the type of y at this point might be different from the type of y at this point. And that brings us to the algorithm. Okay, sorry. And this is a more complex example of uh, HIR. This is an implementation of the common list car function. Uh, and the car function in Lisp is more complicated than just taking the car. It does different things based on the type of the argument. If the argument is a cons, it takes the car of the cons. If the argument is null, it returns null. And if it's something else, it's undefined, but we say it's a type error. So in this more complete example of HIR, we start with an enter instruction, which denotes the beginning of a function. The enter instruction would handle conceptually allocating stack space and uh, parsing the arguments, that kind of thing. So this object is the argument. And then uh, the con is reduced to a series of branches. The branches use these type Q instructions. Type Q is essentially uh, identical to type P, the common list function, but with the uh, type argument is just there. It's not quoted or anything. So type Q is a special operator used by Cle Cleaver, essentially. This prim off car just takes the car of the cons without checking its type or anything. That's the car instruction here. And then at the end of the function, you have this lexical variable temp is turned into a multiple value structure by the uh, F to M or fixed to multiple instruction. And that's turned into a values variable, which represents commas multiple values. And then finally, that's passed to the return instruction. So that's the anatomy of a whole function in HIR. So, since we need to assign types at different points in control flow, uh, what we can use is this thing called Kildall's algorithm, which is a old algorithm from the 70s, I think. Uh, but it works to uh, associate points in the control flow on this control flow graph with some kind of optimization information. And the actual form of that optimization information is pretty, um, you can adapt the algorithm to use different kinds of information for that. So the algorithm proper is, this is the entire algorithm. I'm not really going to explain the whole thing, of course. But essentially, essential ingredients is these, these uh, you go through a work list of instructions with uh, new pools to pools of optimization information to uh, that could be associated with them. And then if the pool that's already associated with the instruction is less than, which can conceptually be better than for some uh, specific purpose, if it's better than the possible new pool, then you don't bother with any of this. But if the new pool has some extra information that's not currently associated with the instruction, you combine the two pools, associate that with the instruction, and then you run this thing called a transfer function. And the transfer function computes a new pool that's then passed to uh, the other instructions that are next to the instruction that you're working on. So 
for example, you can use Kildall's algorithm to compute the liveness of variables. Uh, you say that a variable is live if it has been defined and there is a use of it in the future. Uh, by contrast, a variable is dead if it's either it hasn't been defined yet or it's never going to be used again. In that case, you know, you could uh, release it from storage or the compiler essentially doesn't even concern itself with it anymore. So, in this uh, very simple program, to compute liveness, you start, you follow control flow backwards. That's just specific how you would compute liveness. So, you start at red, and then there's two instructions that it can come from, so you go back to each one of those. And then, each of these instructions, uh, okay, when you start at red, you have uh, an empty information associated with it. You don't have any variables live at the red because that's the end, there are no more uses. When you go back, you can see that at this point right here, uh, x is about to be used. So here, in this instruction, you can say that x is still alive. And similarly, on this one, you can say y is still alive. So the algorithm would proceed from red, and it would go back to this, and it would say, OK, this says x live, and then it would go back here and say, OK, y is live. And then from the left, we go back to the eek. And that eek, it would say, it would copy this pool and say, OK, x is still live. And then when this instruction transfers, you have the existing pool of eek is that x, only x is live. The new pool is that y, only y is live. Um, and since uh, the new information that y is live is not completely uh, included in the information that x is, y is uh, live, you then combine the pools and say that both x and y are live. So it's essentially a very, very general way to do this kind of uh, computation that's pretty common if you're doing any kind of control flow analysis. So when we want to do it in type inference, instead of saying a variable is live or whatever, uh, our, inf our information rules are going to be just a mapping of variables to types at that particular point in the program. So, go backwards. So, with car, for example, we can say at this point, uh, right here, uh, in this instruction, object has been tested to be a cons, and we know it's a cons since it's been tested. So, for this instruction, the pool might be object is a cons. In this one, it would be object is not a cons, and so on, for each variable that's uh, relevant at that point. And then we define that um, the meet of the, the combination of two pools, you go through and you take a union of all the types. The per variable, the um, whether information is better, you just use subtype B. Um, and that's really the entire algorithm. If you have Kildall's algorithm already defined, then you can go through and you can define the type inference version of it in maybe a page. So for a very for a simple example of this, we have this basic on this code. It's written in a slightly artificial form, but it basically says you have a list of double flows going to sum them up. So uh, in HIR, you have a loop that's an actual loop. You can see it you know, going around. So the algorithm would proceed, starting at this, uh, this uh, assignment of the initial uh, sum. And it would go through to the type, the type you see if there's uh, more double quotes remaining on the list. If there are, it takes the first one. And then here we have uh, this combination of things is a bit more complicated. The addition operator uh, in common list obviously involves a lot of uh, checking different types. You do a different thing if you have two double quotes to add versus having two rationals to add. So in this case, we inline the addition operator so that it either checks that both its arguments are double floats, and if they are, it does a special double float add. And if one of them is not, it, does, it falls back to the generic version. And that's a simplified version, but it's essentially what addition does. And you also have this, this new instruction, which represents the uh, common list, the form, which is implied by this uh, type double float, the type declaration. So when build all proceeds, it goes through, it goes through here, we don't really care about the cons, 
And it goes through, it annotates that x is going to be a double float because of the declaration. And we know that uh, the other sum n is 0 d0 because we don't have any information from here yet. And it goes through, infers that both of these must be double floats, that the generic branch is impossible. So by the time you reach this node, and we've done the addition, uh, we still have that the sum variable is going to be a double float. And then that loops around, gets passed back up here, and we come back here, and we have that x is, we still have that sum and x are double floats, so the algorithm uh, finishes, we have everything annotated, we're done. That's the whole thing. Now, the question with this kind of algorithm is we want to know that it stops. Because uh, since this is a compiler, uh, we're pretty much very close to halting problem territory. We want to know that it stops. If we can, we'd like to know, you know how fast it stops. So looking at Kildall's algorithm, the only place that it can actually uh, continue going is that it adds a new instruction to look at at this point. But this is only hit if uh, this condition is false. So therefore, we can show that the algorithm will halt if there's a um, if there's a chain condition between uh, in the definition of pools, which is uh, I'll explain that in a moment. so. For example, if we use the full common list type system for this, uh, then we run into the problem that you can easily construct sequences of types that will get bigger and bigger and bigger, but never actually get the top type. So uh, member types do this, you know, you have one, you have one, two. Or you can just do a disjunction like this. There's a couple different ways to do it. And uh, that will result in the possibility that the uh, type inference algorithm will never halt. It will just keep moving around exactly like the program will move around, which is uh, extremely undesirable. So uh, we need to find a sort of subset of the common list type system that can uh, be more efficient that actually stops for one thing, but is also uh, more quick about it. So uh, we use these, and the algorithm uses these type descriptors they're called, and uh, they only include very basic parts of the type system. Some types we really care about, like fixed num, uh, rationals, that sort of thing, cons, null symbols. They're essentially mostly things that you want to dispatch on, things that come up like definitions of the car. And then we also include uh, unions of these, so you can say a type that's or null, fixed num, that's easy to include in the algorithm, as well as equal types for the sake of constant propagation. And then values types, just because you need something separate for that. And then once you have all this type information, uh, you want to actually apply optimization, of course, to make it go faster. And uh, what you need to do for that is you just take out tests that are redundant. So this is a simplified version of uh, this, where this program has these uh, tests, the double float tests. But since we can prove that this will always be a double float given this declaration, we can cut out those tests entirely along with the declaration. And that gives us this much more simplified code that just does the double float add directly. And um, if uh, all the functions that you use are inline appropriately so that the tests actually show up in the HIR. And this is, the, this is essentially the only type optimization necessary in that uh, pretty much any optimization you can think of with types can sort of be reduced to that. There are exceptions, there are things you can do with constant types, but uh, this is, covers almost everything. Uh, and then we're extending it a little bit. Uh, when Kildall was writing, he was uh, writing in terms of sort of a big Fortran sort of language. So there are no first class functions or anything like that. Uh, to analyze first class functions in this, uh, you need to uh, realize that they're essentially just like instructions. You have inputs and you have outputs and that kind of thing. In HIR, uh, the calling a function is indicated by this fun call instruction, which shouldn't really be surprising. So uh, in this case, we have this uh, inner function, which just returns a constant for, turn up for reason. That's called with no arguments, and it returns a value. So how Kildall can proceed is it starts at uh, this 
instruction, the center instruction. It proceeds forward, um, and then it hits this enclose instruction. And if it doesn't have any information about this, this function, it can just assume that it returned that it never returned. And then once the analysis goes through here and returns it and uh, finds that this function always returns four, that information can then show up here, and that will go through the algorithm, and then it will determine that four is a type function returning four and then find that this is four, so on and so forth. And that uh, is all you need to do to uh, do type inference and inner functions. So uh, then future directions for this. The main weakness of the system right now is with closure variables, because closure variables are, uh, in HIR at least, they're more like uh, values themselves than variables. You can include them into a closure, and then that closure might include them in another closure. So you have to track them more like values than like variables. So uh, integrating that is uh, much more complicated. And then uh, for a full type inference system like you would expect, you would expect a kind of interfunction optimization. You know, you write out uh, a defun, and that's inferred to have so-and-so type. And that inferred type is stored so that the next time you call that function, the compiler knows that it's infer been inferred to return so and so. And that's not part of the algorithm per se, but it's an important component of any kind of type inference. Uh, additionally, we, uh, you can imagine a system that uses uh, types outside the common list type system. Uh, for example, uh, the type of an identity function would be. Uh, you know that the output of an identity function has the same type as the input of an identity function, but this can't really be expressed in common list of types. So types like that could be added to the system to improve the situation. And then, and then finally, um, you can reduce inlining by uh, working directly with function. You can have the algorithm work directly with uh, calls to the addition function, and so on. Um, and that could possibly reduce code size if that becomes an issue. And that's it. So the structs also under the basic types? Um, are they what? Sorry. Yes. Well, yes, it's certainly possible that structs could uh, fit under the basic types, and um, that would improve, you know, structure accesses, that kind of thing. Uh, Sickle, the system, is intended to have uh, uh, a def struct that has uh, proper redefinition. So you can have a def struct, then you can refine it, which is uh, good for safety, but it does pretty much prevent you from doing that kind of thing. But on the other hand, SQL is intended to be customizable enough that that could be added if necessary. That would probably be another good thing I hadn't thought about. Yeah. So how do you exactly uh, create integer types? I see you only represent fixed number, but how do you propagate it? Because they have two fixed numbers, it's obviously not a fixed number anymore. Things like that. So how do you create integers? Right, well, I mean, if you do have an addition of two fixed nums, and that's all, and that's actually all the information that you have, then there's, I mean, you can propagate that it's going to be an integer, and that's the end of the story. Um, it would be possible, uh, another direction to add, would be to add proper integer ranges. The problem is that an integer range uh, also fails the chain condition. You can have, you know, the range one to five, then the range one to six, one to seven. And that will keep increasing, and that can, again, make the algorithm not fall. You can, um, I believe it would be possible to track them only going forward, and then kind of upgrade it to an integer type if there's a loop. Um, but that hasn't been done yet. Uh, so currently, the number types that are used are just uh, fixed num, big num, ratio, uh, the different float types, and the different complex types. Any other questions? Well, I, think you, I think you can take out um, ratios and big numbers actually because the computation for um, 
anything that has to do with those pipes is going to be way more expensive than test so. Right. It's um, it's true that uh, computation with big numbers and so on aren't um, uh, a big priority. Uh, the reason that I uh, use the type descriptors I did is because it's based on the uh, the type system in uh, H. Baker's uh, subtype E. Baker, and that just divides up the uh, divides up the space of possible values. So uh, right now, if you go back to the list of types that work, there's this other type here. And that just includes everything we don't really care about. But that could include big nums, but then if you, if you add the type number or something, then it would have to include the other type and it would be essentially as good as T, even though there are some tests you could eliminate with that. So that's right, big nums. Two more questions? Short? Um, so, so the current work is only for performance, so this is only HHPC stuff, and, and so how do you imagine the compiler because the patient will also want to type the relation just for the help for the performance, which is uh, the uses, how do you uh, do the ones, two separate modules, or do you basically fix them? Uh, you're asking how you do it for uh, error messages and stuff? Yeah. Um, what? Unreachable code. What? Unreachable code. Uh, yeah, so for unreachable code, that's more or less, that's essentially covered under the pruning. If you have, like, for example, in this original, in the original version, the generic edition instruction is unreachable just because of the way it's typed. Uh, we wouldn't want to warn about this, obviously, but um, you're essentially cutting out, this is essentially cutting out unreachable code. The uh, warnings to report that at this point are uh, there aren't any. It's completely inadequate. Um, but uh, a lot of that is due to there's currently a, a lack of the source tracking system. Once that is implemented, then I can start thinking about how to do error messages for that kind of thing. And it's definitely, it's definitely a priority. I mean, uh, otherwise you have a situation where you just have the compiler silently cutting things out and you don't know why your code isn't working. Well, on the other hand, I've had the opposite experience where I have a thousand messages from SPC I'll tell you how to code, and I can do it. Yeah, it would be nice to have a kind of middle path going, yeah, between that and that. Thank you very much. Uh,